Hello everyone, happy winter, spring, we're not quite sure. Uh, I am Andrew Blair, I'm the practice manager at Trenton Pet Hospital. I'm here with Dr. Ginny Beans, Hello. who is the owner uh, at Trenton Pet Hospital, among many things. Um, we are, I don't know, number six, is this probably the so, sixth yeah. in our series yes. of uh, Coffee with a Vet, so hopefully you've uh, got a refreshment and you're able to join us. Today's topic is anxiety in pets, and I think we could probably talk about that for a number of hours, but we're going to condense some of the most important things. We're going to have some tips, tricks, products uh, to chat about, and we'll even get into the upcoming solar eclipse. So, Ooh, yes. Dr. Who's Ginny, excited? take it away. Oh, and, and send me messages because I'll be getting them on the iPad as we go. You've got questions. Okay. Well, anxiety in pets is a big, huge uh, topic and as Andrew said I can go on hours and hours and probably days talking about anxiety so I have here a little uh, outline to keep me straight and narrow so to make sure that I cover most of the uh, most of the topic at least within our life so number one is the definition of anxiety in pets and how does it differ from normal stress we're all exposed to well, anxiety in pets refers to a state of distress or unease experienced by pets in response to stimuli or situations that they perceive as threatening or unfamiliar. This condition mirrors the human experience of anxiety, but manifests in ways that align with the specific behaviors and expressions of different species. Hey, I just, just reading that made me feel smarter, <laughs> okay? The interesting thing is I did want to mention is uh, the age because we are starting seeing anxiety or maybe we're paying more attention to um, anxiety starting younger, younger and younger. And I would say that um, anxiety in dogs would be uh, definitely prevalent versus anxiety in cats. There is still anxiety in cats, but the way how two species uh, manifest the symptoms is a little bit different. But quite often, we're starting recognizing symptoms of early anxiety in pets as young as eight weeks of age. And we always tell our customers, our clients, is to pay attention to that and address anxiety early, uh, figure it out the triggers, and try to uh, desensitize or um, work with the triggers to reduce the possibility of anxieties in pets or to slow down the progression of the anxiety. Anxiety is um, illness. There is no cure from anxiety. And uh, what we can do is we can maintain it, we can manage it, we can make it better. We can do, get it to such a way that we wouldn't even know that has anxiety unless we're not doing certain, humans are not doing certain behaviors. And some pets obviously do need to be on uh, behavioral modification, uh, modi behavior modification medications. So what are the common signs of anxiety? And I'm gonna talk about common signs of anxiety in dogs. By the way, Andrew, do you have pets with anxiety? <laughs> Me, anxiety, the dogs <laughs> have anxiety, the cat has anxiety. Yes, we, uh, we definitely deal with a multitude of, and, and they're all different types of anxiety mm -hmm. um, within our home. So it's quite interesting. And sometimes you forget, um, about what you're doing and then you realize how your pet is reacting and you have to modify, so. Absolutely. Yeah. And I'm sure that you're seeing anxiety symptoms in dogs would be very different than anxiety symptoms in cats, right? Well, a cat usually just runs away and hides, right? Um, whereas the dog, who's naturally trying to be close to you, is, is a lot more visibly disturbed. And I've even noticed in Jack, my 13-year-old Jack Russell, didn't nothing really bothered him before, Fireworks didn't matter. Now I cannot hang up a photo and, and put a nail in the wall without him just shaking and shivering. So as he has aged, yes. his anxiety has gotten worse. worse, and, worse and worse. Age is not a disease, as we yeah. say, but it does come with some other complications. Absolutely, absolutely. Yes, and uh, actually, um, Andrew did mention one of the symptoms of anxiety could be a simple shaking, mm -hmm. right? A pet is shaking for absolutely no reason. Some, and it could be, uh, anxiety symptoms could be from very, very mild, um, such as hiding, for example, mm -hmm. shaking, all the way to destructive, right? Like they chewing your uh, We had a dog furniture. end up on the roof. Yeah. Bust through a screen, up on the second story roof. 
uh, yes. due to anxiety construction that was going on around the house. Yeah, cats are interesting because cats usually uh, will be anxious and so show their anxiety by hiding, but also inappropriate yeah, elim spraying. elimination, yeah. right? Inappropriate elimination. Sometimes they will spray. Also, I would say, I would correct. I don't think necessarily they would spray, they're gonna urinate in an appropriate space. When a cat sprays inappropriately, that could be indication of a spasm, urethral spasm, or even crystals in the urine that may be a little bit different. But if they are like literally going into the spot, they've never urinated before, your laundry basket, your um, bed, or your couch, and they pee on it, or poo, that could be a sign of stress. That definitely could be you an issue. Yeah. yeah, they are sending you um, a message. Um, so uh, let me see. So I didn't want to forget anything. So trembling, panting, excessive grooming is definitely mm -hmm. or in a big, especially I would say excessive grooming is very prevalent in large dogs, German Shepherd dogs, Dobermans. It goes um, from licking horses. paws to the couch to the chair, like it, it's an obsession. But also licking the front, like licking the mm -hmm. front of the long bones, okay? Usually if you start seeing some damage to the skin done in, a, in front of the long bones, in the front legs, most likely I would say number one reason for that would be indeed um, anxiety, anxiety provoking excessive licking. Cats on the other hand, they also will lick their front legs but they also will lick inside their legs as well, like in the belly area and inside the area, inside the uh, groin area. So those all could be signs of anxiety. With cats, sometimes it could be trickier because our allergic cats, like our food allergic cats, actually will lick and will uh, lick off the hair exactly the same spot as a behavioral anxiety. You can't tell the difference. You cannot tell the difference. So a lot of times in the cats, for example, who present with a naked bellies or naked front legs, um, you will see us recommending not only anti-anxiety medication, actually maybe even step two recommending anti-anxiety medications. Number one, we will rule out uh, possibility of food allergies, okay? So, um, of course, like we talked about destructiveness, aggression, aggression could be a sign of anxiety. If your cat is, if your dog is um, seeing another dog or moving human uh, out of the window and very aggressive reacts very aggressively, uh, it could be a sign of anxiety, right? Um, destructiveness, we talked about that, excessive barking, meowing, avoidance behaviors, um, all of those could be, and, some, and on a physiological level, those cats will be panting, they will have increased heart rate, sometimes they may not want to eat. So anxiety is a real issue, it is a quality of life issue, I would say, and if it's not controlled, not only the pet necessarily may be suffering, but also us watching our pet in distress, and not knowing how to help could be quite distressing to us as well. Even that freeze, you know, you see them get in that oh, freeze yes. mode and people think, oh, perfect, they're, they're stopped, they're quiet, they're freaking out internally. Yes, so, and that could be fear. Absolutely. Like the fear, such a severe fear that they're literally frozen in yeah. fear, right? There is a lot of different types of anxiety, um, especially in, in dogs, I would say, they're a little bit more better differentiated. We will have our separation anxiety, we're gonna have our noise phobia anxiety, we're gonna have a social anxiety, we're also gonna have a fear of unfamiliar environments anxiety as well. So for example, come, for example, your pet is absolutely wonderful but comes into the clinic and is absolutely terrified of new people, maybe even of the smell of a hospital, right? The maybe floors. The floor and even the needles. Hey, there is a reason why we hide the needles. We don't show them to our pets because they know, they absolutely do know, right? So uh, I would say in 90% of the cases, pets who show anxiety in a clinic most of the times I have some kind of anxiety at home. I would say 90% of these cases. There are 10% who are truly are afraid of medical procedures. Yeah. Hey, I'm one of them. I was gonna say, <laughs> you. I am one of them, so yeah. I completely understand those pets. But I would say majority of the time, it's just a manifestation of another anxiety at home. 
So let's talk about triggers. What, for example, triggers Jack? Well, you did say like So loud. noise, loud noises with yeah. Jack. Um, for beauty, it, it, and this is where things can change over time and you're able to desensitize. It was car rides. Mm. Uh, you know, she was flown halfway across the world from Egypt. So she, uh, you know, and I'm sure it was not a pleasant flight Yes. Um, in cargo. So she naturally then had that type of issue. Um, lots of... Um, other dog aggression type of, of thing as, uh, as well. Um, but I think even um, in terms of Saul, uh, another tripod that I have, for him it is now, and, and I remember this because I had a cousin when I was a kid whose dog Woody licked forever. Hi Sandy, if you're watching. Woody licked forever and it was, it was anxiety and now I watch Saul. Oh. And Saul is doing it to the point where, you know, you're going, okay, enough, please stop. Yes. Right. And yeah. so then you're trying to give a, a, a toy or something else to, to, yes. to, yeah, to distract, but it's an every night occurrence now. Oh, so absolutely. Wow. wow. with no environmental yeah. changes, just, I would say that genetics, genetics are a big component in anxiety. And I'm saying it because I have a German shepherd dog. And German Shepherd dogs are absolutely famous for their severe anxiety. Is she licking severe. her, her She's arms? not. She's oh, doing none okay. of that. But I shouldn't I should say that. Actually, I'm going to correct myself. Remember she was licking the end of her tail? Yes. Not leaving it alone. Yes. Do you Wouldn't remember that? It, yeah. Would not leave it alone. It's just, just healing. I think in her particular case, it was a combination of um, anxiety, like I think she is a very anxious dog by her breed, but I think she also wasn't feeling well because yeah. of that cancer we have removed, yeah. right? Yeah. And it just obviously took time to grow for us to figure it out. But it's all wrong. those little signs, yes, right? Yeah. They really do tell us. <laughs> and right now, her tail is finally healing and the hair is growing back, but yeah, they sometimes pick a part of the body mm -hmm. and like my shepherd, instead of front leg, like I was telling everybody, she picked the end of her tail and she was chewing and chewing and chewing on her tail. And it's, it's, it could be very frustrating because how do you stop a dog from chewing on your tail, right? Well, and even the sounds, I mean, I'm sure we've all woken up to yeah. a pet licking or, you know, it, it can be frustrating. Absolutely. So, um, Separation anxiety is a huge, huge, huge one. And there were uh, quite a few new studies actually came out and they did prove that if we remove our puppies or kittens from their moms before, hold on to your seat, three months of age, three months of age. And the typical is two, so almost typical every Typical is six weeks. Is it six now? I thought he six couldn't be home Six weeks eight. now. But if we remove puppies or kittens before three months of age, the likelihood of them developing anxieties is very high. I would say 90% probably. Again, those are anecdotal numbers. Please don't quote me. <laughs> okay. They're not our numbers. <laughs> They're not our numbers. Those are anecdotal numbers. But they, I guess what I'm trying to say is there is a new push, I guess, or I'm hoping there is new, there is new movement is that the puppies will stay with their mom much, much longer than just six weeks. Yeah. And that's okay? not something we even really have control over, No, right? not at all, right? So they come to us already predisposed. Yeah. yeah. But another thing is, like, a lot of breeders, like, I would say uh, accidental breeders, right? They they just want them gone, yeah. right? They, they're yeah. not making any money of those puppies. It wasn't wasn't planned. Yeah. It is a lot of work. Yeah, they're to not have equipped to deal with this, all of that. Right? So yeah. They want them gone. They want them to go, right? And unfortunately, the trouble is that they do need that socialization, safety, emotional help from their mom to start in their life much more like uh, self assured, right? With a better confidence levels. Um, so we talked about loud noises. Oh man, loud noises, right? So my dog, for example, if um, she like if there is a storm, yeah, right? Oh, yeah, storm, yeah. and we got the tin roof, tin roof, metal roof, metal yeah. roof yeah. and like if there is a noise, you can hear right? It now, yeah. My dog just wants to get inside the bathtub. Yeah. Okay. Why bathtub? I did read a little bit about that. Apparently, the bathtub disrupts some kind of magnetic fields, and they actually do not feel the vibrations inside the bathtub, which they feel otherwise. 
It's not weird. It's like a shield. It is like a shield. It's crazy. Wow. I don't feel Ours like always would hide in the laundry room in the dirty clothes. Yeah. Yeah, as a yeah. kid. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so if your dog <laughs> or cat during the storm wants to go in the bathtub, there is a reason why they well, want it's, to. It's funny you talk about, and I'm sure on, <clears throat> on your list is, is sound, um, you know, obviously the sound from the storm. But um, I've seen a lot of studies about, you know, I remember in my last house, we used to have mice in the garage. So I would have mouse traps, but I would also have those ultrasonic oh, yes. mouse repellent yes. deterrents that we could not hear. Yes. And I could tell very quickly that these had an effect on the dogs. Yes. So, you know, there are a lot of, you got to think of all the mechanical things in our houses, the hums, the yes. noises, anything new that you're introducing. Yes. And of course, we're, we're always listening to, to loud things and playing games. There's a lot of stuff. A lot of noise. A lot of stuff. So we don't even. We, may we not don't even think twice hear. about it. We don't even hear no. what they actually may hear, right? So changes in the environment and routine, moving, us moving, new people coming into the house, people moving out of the house, super busy, not busy enough. Changes right? in schedules. Yes, yes. So those, COVID was a very big example. Mm -hmm. What happens when uh, everybody is inside the house? And all of a sudden, people started working on those pets who absolutely have no skills how not to socialize. No socialize. Nothing. They don't know how to behave themselves without humans around them. Now coming in with quite severe behavioral challenges, right? Anxieties, yeah. traumatic experiences, and past abuse. <clears throat> so. A lot of people bring their puppies, um, and sometimes if the puppy is showing any signs of anxiety, they will blame that the puppy was abused by whatever, previous owner or previous. And I would have to say that if puppies or kittens have been um, exposed to abusive behavior up to three months, okay, and then you have received that puppy or kitten, within between three and six months of age, you can completely undo all the damage. Isn't that crazy? Well, I mean, the, the same is true for children under a certain yeah. age, right? Like then, then the damage is done. If it's not yes. reversed, then they're gonna it's, have lifelong challenges. But what I, what I guess what the message I'm trying to send is, if you have received a puppy who has been possibly abused, we don't know. Even suspect. Or suspect. Yeah. You have a whole, like, until six months of age to undo all the damage without any lasting effects. You just have to work at it, and you have to, obviously, identify the triggers. But the good news is that damage is completely could be undone, mm -hmm. which is absolutely amazing. Now, if your puppy is older than six months of age and has been abused, well, they say it takes double the time the pet was abused for it to get out of that yeah. situation, like emotional uh, distress. Thing. And that is a lot of work, a lot of trust, a lot of time. Oh, absolutely, so, yeah. absolutely. But it takes, so if your pet has been abused, for example, for a year, be prepared. Two mm -hmm. years it will take you to get the pet back out of a shell. Well, sometimes you won't know until the pet is presented with, you know, that yeah. experience. I've had pets where, um, you know, everything is fine and then one day, you know, you go to bring them on the boat, for example, yes. or they see a hockey stick and maybe they've been previously hit with a hockey stick and that will send them, right? So sometimes yes. we don't always know. Until we get there. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, and uh, there could be triggers like, you know, like interaction with unfamiliar people and other pets or animals, which is completely That gives me anxiety. Yeah, exactly. It's a face. I always like... Um, when it comes to that, I feel sometimes we are not recognizing or maybe not respecting enough our pet's personalities, right? We get our pet and of course we want that pet to be interactive with us, happy with us, do everything, like participate. But hey, pets could also be introverts. Absolutely. And they could be extroverts. Boundaries. Pets and they have could be, boundaries. And they could be neurodiverse. <laughs> yes, right? They can. Absolutely. Yeah. And they could be also autistic. Maybe not official diagnosis, yeah. but they definitely can be, right? And sometimes I think it takes a little bit of a 
mind change, like mindset change, to recognize that, okay, that, hey, you, you got yourself, um, you know, like in, um, yeah. in a, a introvert, Introvert Pat, yeah. you're not gonna be. He's not gonna be like jumping all over, no. being super happy. Right? I mean, I've thought many times. <laughs> I, you know, with one of my dogs, I am able to take her anywhere in the car to the cottage. She stays off leash. She is just. She's the perfect dog in that sense, right? The other three, they have to be tied up. They can't be around other pets, you know. And I, and I've often thought, oh. Uh, this is the kind of dog I want, you know, yeah. I know the boundaries and the limits and the yeah. issues with the others. So you, you really do have to respect that or you're forever going to be fighting it. And uh, you're the bond I think is going to, to break down. So sometimes you have to learn what's a behavioral thing and what's just a personality thing. You know what? It's funny you mentioned the bond, right? Mm -hmm. Because um, one of the things I want to touch on is uh, what are the implications of the anxiety and definitely weakening or even dis destroying human animal bond is number one, mm -hmm. right? Um, I always feel very, very sad when I see some clients that bring their pets and they don't like their pets or they, yeah. they want to like them, but they're they done can. with it. could be inappropriate yeah. urination, like all those things that or are Or gonna... they're afraid of their pet, yeah. right? They're afraid of yeah. their pet, so they cannot interact in their pet in a healthy, safe manner, right? And that's sad because that probably should have been addressed when they were young. Yeah. That probably should have been... Uh, and we're going to talk a little bit more how we can uh, nip it in the bud, so to speak, yes. the anxiety, early anxieties. There is, of course, like uh, physical health effects. Like if you are in a state of anxiety, you're going to have like your cortisol levels go up. Cortisol levels will suppress your immune system. That means that you're going to be much more predisposed to infections, to uh, other problems, right? Kidney disease, liver, anything, right? because your immune system is not great. Not to mention like your coat may not look great. You pro those pets usually are a bit more on the skinny side, funny enough, because they burn so much energy being anxious, right? But definitely- So why uh, am I not thin? I don't know, I don't know. <laughs> Working on it. And there is of course like emotional impact, decreased quality of life and depression, right? Yeah. Like, and depression. So let's talk a little bit about um, uh, what can we do as a pet owners, right? From the moment we got this happy, happy, well, we are happy. We don't know yet if our puppy is happy. Yeah. Being removed from the mom, getting into new household. Maybe the household is very busy. It's maybe And everybody's scary. excited for a new puppy and they're going to the vehicle in a new house and a new crate. Yeah, and... everything is new. Yeah. And you are absolutely spoiling them with love, with attention, with everything. But they may not see it that way. Mm -hmm. They may be scared, right? I always, I, I always uh, counsel our new pet owners <coughs> is to have a safety space for your pet, right? So whether it's a crate, in my humble opinion, crate is the best safety spot for your pet, whether it's a crate or whatever spot you assigned to your pet. And I always train other pets, including ourselves and our children, is when a pet goes to that space, do not touch them. Yeah. This is their uh, this is and stay plate. out of it. Don't yeah. don't go in it with them. And that's yeah. their safety. This is their safety spot. Yeah. Keep it happy. Lots of food. Lots of treats. Like lot new toys. Everything comes into that safe, happy place. And that I would say, knowing that the pet has a place he can get, he or she can get away, even for a minute or two minutes, mm -hmm. is a lot. And it's a huge. Um, it will help quite dramatically in preventing um, any fear aggression, mm -hmm. right? Any fear, um, any... They have an escape, any right? Any biting, yeah. right? With a, like any biting accidents with the small children especially, because they can get away, right? If the kids are annoying them, like, oh, come on, I'm gonna dress you up and whatnot. That just sometimes needs like two, three minutes. Yeah. Doesn't need a lot. It, it's amazing how social our pets are and they do crave our attention. Just sometimes they need a little break. We also have to learn, I think, um, and you know, obviously it's very difficult with children, but to recognize the signs in our own pets. I know as fear-free certified um, clinic, 
you know, one of the biggest things that, you know, we're, we're taught and we learn and we are always looking for is just the signs, right? Yeah. Eye movements, body language. Oh, yes. Sometimes that is enough if you can understand what your pet's sort of body language is to know, okay, you know, Fluffy's had enough. Let's, let's give this pup mm -hmm. a break or whatever the case. Even, even cats, you know, Absolutely. can only tolerate yes. up to so much, probably less than dogs. But, much uh, less than dogs. Yeah. With cats, I always say, let the cat come to you. Do not go and reach out for the cat. Let the cat come to you. They will come to you, but let them come to you. Yeah. And with cats, you need to really learn their body language. They will give this, they a sign that they've had enough. Just their signs are much more subtle. Mm -hmm. And you have, and they have much shorter fuse before that paw or cross. Petting and purring out. to that swat. And you yeah. think, what? You were just what purring. Did what, I know? what did I do? And you know, the sign was there, but the we didn't was, see it. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Exactly. Um, I do believe a lot in mental stimulation. Boring pet will be anxious yeah. pet, right? Destructive. Uh, destructive. They need, there is a lot of energy coming out mm -hmm. of that little body or big body. It needs to come out somewhere. And uh, mental stimulation is one of the best ways to burn that extra energy. Whether that involves some uh, exercise activities outside, a uh, good walk, right? Um, or like even the way how we feed our pets. I always have been a big proponent of getting rid of food bowls, get rid of them, throw them in the garbage, and feed your pets in such a way that they actually can have mental stimulation. Give them a maze bowl. Um, you know, you can even quite cheaply, Heather, our treatment room coordinator, has bought a ton of games for her yes. dogs where they actually have to work for the food. They have to, you know, sometimes you see them put an octopus in, uh, you know, in a tank with a jar and a, a oh, shrimp inside yeah. it. That octopus will have to work to get the top yeah. off to get the shrimp. And they really will. It, you know, yes. I think it makes them smarter. It makes them Absolutely. more aware. It keeps the minds going. And quite it frankly, it's yes. kind of fun to watch. So, Absolutely. yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. There is lots of like, there is like a rag feeding, feeding rags, yeah. right? So you, you wrap up the food in a rag and you give it to your pet and they need to figure it out how to unwrap it. And every time they unwrap a little bit, they get a couple of kibbles, they unwrap some more. This is an amazing I do it with food. my cat, believe it or not. Yeah. The cats, you can yeah. get on Amazon, you can get little mice. And they oh, have yes. uh, all the batteries, yes, yeah, yes, all the batteries. Yes. You can get batteries or without batteries. If it's on the batteries, those mice literally will go, will yeah. will drive, well, drive. Well, they have the flopping around. fish too, yes. with little pockets in them for, for treats. So. Oh, up. there is so many ways of fun feeding your pets. Yeah. Uh, and like I agree with, uh, I, I agree with Andrew, it's really fun. And that's just feeding, but then, you know, a number of times, you know, when you've gone out and, and had community events, there's been, um, what do they call it? Like mazes and yes, tunnels and yes. actual physical things other than just walking. Um, people build forts for their pets. Yes. Uh, you know, especially with the pocket pets, people are always building mazes and tunnels and, you know. What about cat terrariums? Yes, cat terrariums? yes. I love those uh, where the cat can come up and, and look. So, yeah, even as simple, I know this sounds silly, I usually on Saturday mornings will play my iPad with... Um, either birds or fish or something for my cat. Oh, yes. Um, we put one of those feeders at our bedroom window, and sure enough, you come home and the cat is sitting on the bed watching. Just stimulated, that's yes. all, as opposed to sleeping somewhere. I agree, I yeah. agree. And now you can actually have those fur cameras, fur baby cameras or something, yep. and it throws a treat It'll, every yeah, now and then. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, there is many, many opportunities to uh, mentally stimulate your cat and get them out of the boredom, get them out of the destructive distract, behavior, yeah. and get them more, and get them tired at the end of the day, mm -hmm. get them to have a good sleep. Um, training and socialization, man, can't say enough about that. And training, it's not necessarily just to teach your pet how to sit and how to stay. Training is more for socialization. Yeah. It's to get out, it's to have this establish that relationship with your pet, um, and there are so many different ways, like, yes, it's of course, it's a good to learn how to sit and stay and walk with your pet, but there is also like scent training, yeah. right? There is a, <coughs> there is like um, um, agility training. Yeah. There are so many different ways and people like love it. It's very good for our yeah. stimulation too. Amazing to be outside with our pets 
And man, the relationship you develop with that, the human animal bond you develop with that pet is quite amazing. Absolutely. Now, amazing. I will say, you know, having a lot of pets myself, I always <laughs> thought that, oh, well, this is great. They socialize each other. But then you very quickly realize when you introduce more people or another pet that they've now bonded as a pack and they have not actually socialized yes. with anybody yes. outside. Yes. And that then becomes an issue. So, so there is a different ways of socialization. Yeah. And we're talking about... So getting a second puppy yeah. for your older lab is not socialization. No, 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 it's not. Socialization is when your pet is comfortable when another person, for example, walks by, mm -hmm. or with your permission, of course, pet your pet, right? Or when another dog goes by and they are able to interact with their dog, the normal dog manner without getting anxious or hiding or becoming aggressive due to anxiety. That is a proper socialization we're talking about. That, I find that very, very stressful personally when I'm either on a walk or when we lived more in city, you know, somebody could walk by and the dogs got to the point where if the camera was set off by motion and of course Alexa would play the, the little noise, the, the dogs would freak out over the noise because they knew that that meant someone was at the front ah. and it was a rush to the front side light and it just, it was yeah. a headache constantly. So even as a, like, it was, I found it stressful, right? Yeah, so yeah, yeah. they're, you know, in, in their mind just running and, and, and freaking out and whatever, but it, it, it disturbs the whole household, I find. I agree. So if that we can do agree. things to like distract and avoid that completely, desensitize probably the best word. Desensitize yeah. is a very good word. Yeah. So, um, so what are the things, we talked a little bit about how we can start preventing um, anxiety, but what if the pet comes in, for example, in a clinic and we already can see symptoms of anxiety? Um, and a couple of things, like I know that we are, showing here we do want to talk a little bit this about couple stuff. things we use yeah. we use before we will um recommend some behavior modification medications okay so um and we use that stuff ourselves this is all clinic yeah. stuff that we use that i've pulled so i want to talk about sander shirt sander shirt is a lifesaver it's an amazing product. My dog grew up in a Sander shirt. It's a hug. It's a hug. It's like, it's a very tight hug. But think about like when your mom hugs you, you have that release of endorphins and you relax. And that's what Sander shirt does, yeah. okay? And uh, can your pet wear it longer than a, like, you know, it says four hours a day? Absolutely, mm -hmm. like I said. My dog grew up in- Actually that. acts like a jacket too. Yeah, it does jacket. act like yeah. a jacket, yeah. yeah. It's a, it's a amazing, amazing thing. It will work with uh, mild cases of uh, noise phobias, like a thunderstorm or like a PS, mild cases. If you have like a moderate to severe cases, it's an excellent additive, mm -hmm. but you may need some other things, okay? So uh, you will see that throughout our, our hospital, we have those plugins, okay? And those are fellow plugins and adaptive plugins. And they are happy dog or cat, respectively, pheromones, mm -hmm. right? Now, with those plugins, you will not smell anything. So a lot of times we don't know, because we can't smell, we can't touch, we can't see, we don't know whether they're working or not. And I can assure you they do. Again, they may not work for severe cases of anxiety, but then the puppy is introducing new pet to the household, um, in the mild cases of anxiety, I think they're a great additive to a complete... Especially when they're protocol. coming into a place like this, even yes. though it has multiple pets visiting the room. I mean, we can clean, we can disinfect, you know, as but much as we want. disinfecting is making it even worse. Well, now it's introducing more things, yeah. right? But something like this, the, the point of it in the clinic anyway, is, is to sort of mask and distract. And I mean, then, of course, one of the, the first things that we um, do when you come in, and sometimes we'll... We'll ask you and maybe you put it on is we have bandanas yes for all the dogs in different sizes 
and we spray. So usually you don't actually see us spray because we spray them ahead of time um, and we have a box of them. And it's the same pheromone. You need 20 minutes, You need 20 minutes because when you first spray, it does kind of have a funny alcohol-y smell. So we'll spray and you'll see us go like this and then we have containers that we put it in so that when you do come for your appointment, it's already been pre-sprayed so you know your your dog is not getting a a big face of it. And of course for cats, we're not putting bandanas on cats. I don't know about you, but I don't want to put a can of uh, bandana on a cat um, you're coming in of course with a carrier please do not just come in carrying your cat um, we have pre-sprayed the towels and they go over the, um, the, the carrier and even the carrier it, you know we do not recommend putting those carriers on the floor they need to be um, up on an elevated that. surface whether it's a counter we have multiple surfaces for that so now, uh, one thing is uh, uh, with uh, spray, with, with the diffusers, they do have expiry. They do. They have six months expiry, as you can see on, well, this one. With and that. when you say expiry, on the actual unit that plugs in, yeah. this is what expires. So we write the date on it. This will just run out after a certain time. And yeah, but the unit. If, this is 30 days, but, and I will also say, unplug it if you're going away. Don't keep it plugged in. Yeah. We yes. unplug them every single night, so. Yeah. So um, those are kind of your first line of defense. Now there are treats. There are treats, uh, they're called Zen treats, mm-hmm. okay? And they actually have tryptophan in those treats. And what they do as a pet choose those treats, um, they actually are more relaxed. Well, hey. What's tryptophan in? <laughs> tryptophan is in Turkey. Turkey. Yes. If you're a Seinfeld fan, yes. <laughs> you will remember. Just feed them lots of turkey. Yeah, so, well, don't, well, don't, don't feed your pet don't turkey. Say that. <laughs> Do not feed no, your pet turkey. No. But um, the tri- tryptophan, that's a chemical which gets released when we, do, when we do consume a lot of turkey, and that's what makes us so mellow and just want to lay down and yeah. just uh, vegetate Cat in now. front yeah. of the TV, right? Yeah. So that's a tryptophan. So they capture it, that chemical, and they put it in uh, quite a few different uh, different uh, nutritional supplements. Mm-hmm. Like I said, the treats would be number one, the chews. Uh, there is also um, Call Me Sure, Call Me Sure. Yes, the stick, right? yeah. Um, so there is a lot of different uh, ways to kind of give a little bit of tryptophan, a little bit of happy Happy, happy Plus there's chemical. distraction. I mean, <coughs> distraction if you have children is a wonderful thing. Yes. You know, lick Absolutely. mats and xylitol free peanut butter and of course treats and distracting your pet from things that I think would normally get them going will take a while. Yeah. But ultimately it does pay off huge. So I'll, 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 give, I'll share with you how I, for example, was training my dog to stop barking like crazy, and I big German Shepherd dog, it's a very scary barking, uh, when anybody would even come to the door, right? Like mailman, I don't know, Was people. The vegetables, the vegetables. <laughs> so what I did is, number one, instead of yelling at her, stop, stop, leave it, I actually say, good girl, we're good, good girl, right? And I would actually give her a chew, mm-hmm. like a stick yeah. to chew on, and this way, I notice she is already like she's barking, kinda, but she's waiting for me to, hey, yeah. I'm here doing my job, doing my job, without getting into that whole, um, you know. And like yelling right is just there. elevating, right? You're yes. trying to be louder than her. She's not listening to you. No, no. And she is like, where is my chew? Where is yeah. my chew? So she did her job. She feels good about it, and she gets a treat. And I'm not being deaf there with her barking like your, crazy. Do you ever get your watch going off, loud environment? Constantly. My dogs, when they oh, bark, no, this no, thing I goes don't. off loud. The decibels are too high. It's amazing, yes. especially Jack. It's a ear piercing. Oh, yes. Even for us, you got to watch that sort of thing. You know what? I have to find my watch. Yes, because it will. Say, it, it does it every morning. Yeah, it's actually it's actually a very good point because loud noises are very stressful for yes. us too. Um, I also wanted to uh, sh- one thing we talked about uh, prevention. Uh, I noticed there is um, like a fad fat diet where it's high protein diets now you can get in the pet stores. And I'm going to tell you, and they market them towards, actually I don't know what they market them. You, you just said dogs? the word, market. market. Marketing. Yeah. Marketing is what it is. Yeah. It's to sell. It's not really and beneficial. The trouble is, for example, when you feed high protein diets, let's say to, um, I don't know, husky 
who already like they're all jumpy and all like you know having uh, excess of energy and then you feed them some more energy because that's what protein is so you're gonna consume the protein protein is going to fill, fulfill your energy requirements but the excess protein will have to be burned comes off somewhere. somewhere and they're not going to the gym they're so. not going to the gym so it's going to be burned in a destructive mm -hmm. behavior so don't go for those marketing strategies like in order for your pet to qualify to be on a high protein diet they need to be working and by working i mean like hard and even in our royal came in um you know when we're calculating the you know the k cows and that type of thing that you need to feed your your pet because it's like us we have a specific calorie requirement and depending on breed they will tell you that uh, unless you have a working dog yes. and working is like I don't know. Uh, Police sniffing dog. Right? Even then, what are those ones they use at the racetracks? You race know? Greyhound. Greyhound. Yes. They are all low, moderate. So exactly. it, there's almost no breed that would ever require that. I would say no pet. In a no regular, household pet. In no. a regular household pet, like I am having troubles coming up with any examples when your pet would need you a take high the marathon protein running. diet. <laughs> Well, yeah. Which obviously you wouldn't even want to take your, your dog. And that's not to even mention the side effects yeah. of feeding a uh, high protein diets is extra strain on the kidneys and liver. Yeah. And we do You'll see, see in that work. in the yeah. blood works, okay? So, um, a lot of diets actually, especially Royal Canin coming out with um, Calm Diet, mm -hmm. it actually does have tryptophan, turkey protein My in it. My cat gets his calm. And uh, it also has reduced amount of protein. Mm -hmm. So, you have enough good quality protein to support your energy, to support all your body, but not to have excess uh, protein to be burned somewhere yeah. else. And everything right? we've talked about so far, like it's non-medicated. We haven't even spoken about yeah. any, any drugs. So, And actually funny you mentioned that because let's do talk about drugs, okay? The um, word drugs. Well, first the of all, word the word drugs, yeah. I will say, I use the word in, in that sense because we're in healthcare, right? It's commonly used word, but I think the word itself has a very negative connotation very for negative. obvious reasons. Yes. You know, we often hear, well, I don't want to drug my pet. You know, I don't want to sedate my pet. I don't want to sedate pet. my pet. So. I don't want the zombie. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> and the fact is, if your pet is a zombie, that is incorrect usage of the medication. Yeah. Those doses need to be adjusted. And the fact is that medications have their important role in managing anxiety. Sometimes anxiety could be severe enough that no matter what you do, no matter what behavior modification techniques you're using, the dopamine and CCRI chemicals are so strong in the brain that the pet has simply no ability to even perceive all those and we things you're doing. Yeah. Right? Wonderful so, pets and they Yeah. So you need to stabilize your brain chemicals, you need to remove the first layer or two of the anxiety before literally a pet will have a clear enough head to look around. Oh, that's what we're gonna do right now. Now I understand those desensitization techniques. Mm -hmm. Now I'm going to go ahead and uh, be um, compliant with uh, socialization classes or whatever, right? But drugs or medications are not dirty word. They need to be used in many, many cases. A lot of times the only way to manage the anxiety, especially in the beginning, is together with uh, behavioral modification medications. Now, I, I do tell our clients that medications will not solve like this is and just do you want to talk problem. about the levels of medication? Because, I mean, for us, when we talk fear-free medications, we're talking, you know... Yeah, like, there is definitely... Like different a, than Prozac yeah. and that type of thing. Well, in the beginning, a lot of times when we are dealing with um, the severe cases of anxiety, we do get them started on a cocktail of medications. Because one medication, number one... A lot of those medications uh, will take time to load in mm -hmm. the brain. It takes uh, six to eight weeks before we're going to see some effects. Well, a lot of 
uh, behaviors that exhibiting during those six weeks are quite destructional, yeah. right? Like, so we need to get like some other medications such as gabapentin or trazodone on board to help in the meantime, okay? So in a fear-free settings, we do use um, uh, gabapentin or in the cases just to remove the first layer of anxiety. So gabapentin is wonderful um, in the short term. It may not be so great a long-term managing of anxiety, although we do use it occasionally because of its sedative effects, right? And sometimes it's very hard to find the perfect dose. The sweet spot. The yeah. sweet spot where your pet is anxiety are being addressed without overwhelming the pet with sedation, right? right? Trazodone is an um, amazing, amazing medication when it's used properly. Um, and a lot of times we need to use trazodone in aggression cases, right? Interdog aggression would be one, right? If the dog comes in and they are aggressive towards new stimuli, new people, we will use trazodone. And trazodone will cause more sedation. But that's in the doses we use in a clinic. And I mean, the reasons are, are I think, fairly obvious when we explain yeah. to people is, A, we don't want to get hurt. She's my only doctor. Um, but we don't want your pet traumatized because yes. that is just going to make every visit after that worse. So, Absolutely. you know, this is something I think that is to, you know, make it safe for everyone and a little, a little less scary. I'll yes. say. Not more enjoyable, obviously, but a little less scary. And I have to say, we have some very, very amazing reviews, mm -hmm. right? Like, in a sense, some people, like, they have their pets who have horrified of coming into the clinic. And with appropriate combination of medication. Well, they've actually, seen the difference, right? They've been, yeah. seen the previous clinic. They come here and they go, is this the same pet? Yes. You know? But I always yeah. caution, and, and I'm not even medical, but I, I sometimes laugh because we have a lot of people that come in and they're, you know, they're trained medical professionals. Dosages in pets are very different. Yes. Yes. than humans. So if your, you know, dog is getting 600 milligrams of gabapentin, you know, even though gabapentin is a human medication, we would not, you know, you would not be prescribed that as a person. So just Absolutely. be aware that those yeah. dosages are quite different. Well, to round up, <laughs> it's been a we long... Because like, there's so much I know. you can talk We can about. keep talking, but to round up, I think it is important to recognize early signs of anxiety. Mm -hmm. Uh, age does not mean your pet cannot have anxiety. Uh, they can stop as early as eight weeks of age, okay? Um, we talked a little bit about uh, proper socialization, uh, involving pets in the classes, um, and uh, getting another pet is, does not equal proper Happy socialization. Happy visits and getting a vet? Happy visits are a big one. Uh, we are very proud of our happy visits. You, you're welcome to bring your pet. Uh, we will spoil it, we will love it, we'll give treats. Book or an appointment, it, yeah. they don't even have to be, it's not for vaccines, no, this is the come, no, just run around the clinic, smell, get yeah. some loving from us, and there leave. Yeah. And if your pet happy visit consists of coming in and leaving, that's fine too, that is okay. Just the experience of smelling, just experience, yeah. yeah. And we also talked a little bit about that there are some cases of anxiety which will need medications, and medications is not a dirty word. Mm -hmm. um, we will go, we will obviously try our best to explain to you uh, in the cases which do feel need medications. But I think that uh, helping your pet dealing with anxieties is important not only for your pet mental health, well right? but it's also for the bond, yeah. but for us too. Yeah, for sure. Right? We do not want, we want to be happy and socialize with our pet, and we want to be enjoying all the benefits a human animal bond uh, gives us. You know, when you pet your, you pet your pet, your blood pressure drops, mm -hmm. well, you need to be able to pet your pet. <laughs> It's true. Yeah, yeah, it's true. So that's kind of what we're doing. So I hope it was helpful. Did you get any questions, Andrew? Um, I didn't actually get any questions, but I, I see quite a few people who have been watching popping in and out, which is nice. I actually also post these on YouTube afterwards because, you know, this is not for Trenton Pet Hospital uh, mm -hmm. clients you know, only. This is for everyone. It's just general information, general knowledge, tips, tricks whatever our own experiences um hopefully you get a laugh out of it too but uh yeah. it's also i think our way dr jenny's way of, of giving back because you don't always have direct access um to your veterinarian unless you've got that appointment and you know hopefully you've got a healthy pet and they're only at the the office once a year so 
Yeah. Um, you know, at any time, send us comments, send us suggestions. Uh, I, I don't even, I can't even remember what our next topic is. But I think it was arthritis and cats. Ooh, that's going to be a, yeah. that's a big one too. Yes, I think we're going to be talking next year. And the discussion year. this year is so different than what yes. it would have been last year because yes. some amazing stuff has come out. Yeah, so, yeah. Uh, yes, so tune in in the next couple of weeks. Next, yeah. We're going to be talking weeks. about arthritis in our pets, and that includes cats. Cats do get arthritis. So do we. Yes, and humans, but yeah. we're going to talk only about pets. <laughs> okay, thank, thank you for you joining guys. us.